to the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us your word. We have the privilege of reading it in our own language, of having many different copies in many of our houses. And as we read, sometimes we find difficulties and uncertainties. Sometimes we are led to ask questions, as Nathan has said. And we pray that this evening you will show us the reality of your word and help us to see answers to some of the questions we may ask. Thank you that every time we read your word, the Holy Spirit can stimulate us to understand it better. And we pray that through this evening you will enable us to understand your word better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The answer to the question is no. <laughs> Last Sunday morning when the talk was announced, you were informed that I would not be walking away after giving that answer. So let's go forward. We can't leave the question with just the answer no. And some of you, perhaps slightly older ones, will have read books telling you that archaeologists have dug up the walls that fell when the Israelites walked round Jericho. There are two problems. First, when did the Israelites arrive at Jericho? The date. And the second, why haven't the walls been found? Before we look at those questions, we need to remind ourselves a little bit about archaeology so that we understand better some of the answers. <clears throat> archaeology studies the remains of human activity in the past, which may be great monuments like the pyramids of Egypt, which contain inscriptions telling us about them. So we don't have to look at the pyramid scratch our heads and ask why ever did they build that there's information available but when we turn to stonehenge there's no information available people who built stonehenge didn't write there was no writing in britain at that time so we have no records about it and this is often true with archaeology we find objects we find buildings we find ruins but we have to interpret them according to whatever information becomes available to us. Archaeology may tell us what people ate by digging up bones and seeds, what they wore by finding bits of their clothes, but it can't tell us what people said or what people thought unless there are written documents. And when we turn to the Holy Land, we find but although people could read and write, most of their documents were written on the ancient equivalent of paper, papyrus brought from Egypt, or on leather rolls. And these things, if buried in the earth, usually rot away. So we have very, very few written documents from the Holy Land. It's unlikely that anybody will ever find anything that Joshua wrote. When archaeologists dig into the ruins of ancient times, ancient towns, the things they're likely to find are things the inhabitants didn't want. If they had a house that was tumbling down, they'd build a new house and may, maybe leave some old pots and pans and other bits and pieces in the old house. But then they'd move to the new house and have new pots and pans and the process would go on. Only if they had to leave suddenly, if there was an epidemic or a fire or an enemy came along, would they leave much more in their houses, which archaeologists might dig up. Archaeologists divide the past into three ages, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, according to the materials which were most commonly used for tools and other implements. 
the events in the book of Joshua fall at the point in time when the Bronze Age was giving way to the Iron Age. So in some places we find mixtures of tools and weapons, some made of bronze, like these axes, and some made of iron, like swords and knives. <coughs> but first, the beginning of the Iron Age, iron was not common. You may know you have to have quite a high temperature in order to produce iron, smelting the ores and uh, hammering. And so iron at first was not common, and I think that's why, if you read in the book of Joshua chapter 17, you'll find that the Canaanites were feared by the Israelites because they had iron chariots. I don't believe they were made of iron, like a, a modern metal truck, but probably the wheels had iron tires, which would mean they'd run better on stony ground. If they only had leather tires, or no tires at all, they would splinter more quickly. The iron chariots, so far as the Israelites were concerned, were the latest model of tank, <laughs> and uh, obviously frightened them. So if you look at the book of, Osh of Joshua in the light of archaeology, well, we can't expect to find specific information about in ancient Israel, but we may find out about the circumstances that the book relates. The first problem then is the question of date. According to 1 Kings chapter 6, King Solomon began to build the temple in Jerusalem in the fourth year of his reign, which was 480 years since the exodus from Egypt. The start of Solomon's reign can be set at about six, uh, 970 BC on the basis of links between later kings of Israel and Judah and kings of Assyria, whose dates are well fixed. That date means the exodus would have begun about 1446 BC and Joshua arriving 40 years later at Jericho, 1406. Some biblical scholars argue that that is the date and we should develop our studies on that basis. They expect to dig up evidence in the land of Canaan for the Israelite conquest at that time. But many other scholars, including me, find strong reasons to prefer a later, lower date in the 13th century BC. In that case, the 480 years in 1 Kings 6 has to be interpreted as a symbolic figure. You can understand it as uh, 40 times 12, the number of tribes, or as uh, 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 12 generations, each generation being about 40 years. Hebrew ways of expressing time differed from the mathematical precision we're used to, and you can see a problem in that sort of computation in Genesis chapter 15, where the enslavement of the Israelites in Egypt for 400 years is equated to four generations. So each generation would be 100 years, which is highly improbable. <laughs> So I don't believe that we should take the date in Exodus 6 uh, as being a, a date in the sort we find in historical chronology. We know the Israelites were in the land of Canaan shortly before 1200 BC because an Egyptian pharaoh called Menaptah had a monument engraved with a poem about his conquests, most, mostly in Libya and North Africa, but at the end, a little note telling us that his army had conquered towns in Canaan, Ashkelon, Gezer, Yenuam, and a people called Israel. It's interesting to see that the Egyptian hieroglyphic signs for Israel, which are written here, have in front of them 
we just about see a man and a woman sitting down. And that indicates that the name Israel was not the name of a place or a town, but a group of people, possibly the Israelites still settling in their promised land. So this is the first fixed date that we have where something outside the Bible mentions Israel at a particular time. So why haven't the walls of Jericho been found? This map shows you the location of Jericho down in the Jordan Valley and the Israelite camp in the plains of Moab on the east side of the river when, as we read this morning, Joshua became their leader. Jericho lies 840 feet below sea level. I'm sorry, I'm too old to tell you what that is in meters. <laughs> <laughs> A strong spring there has created... Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> the next one. Where you can see the palm trees and in one passage in the Bible it's called the City of Palms. The spring still runs as it's run for thousands of years and produces a great deal of fertile land which feeds a large Palestinian population. The wind from the hills on the west blows strongly down onto the mound so that the upper part, this is the ruined mound of Jericho, is scoured flat. The action of the wind and sand soon erodes anything at the top. Today the mound of ruins is called Tel Es Sultan, which means the Sultan of the King's Mound. Tel being the Arabic and Hebrew word for a mound of ruins. Here's a, a view of a great stone rampart erected in the Middle Bronze Age in the time of Abraham. And just at the top, you can see arrowed a few courses of brickwork, which are a wall of a later date built on top of that stone wall. There's no more of that wall left because it's all been eroded by the action of the wind. The bricks are simply mud, dried in the sun, not baked in a kiln as our bricks are, so they tend to wear away quite rapidly if they're not kept in good order. In the 1930s, a professor from the University of Liverpool, John Garstang, excavated in the ruins of Jericho, and he found walls which he claimed collapsed and were the walls that collapsed in front of the Israelites. Following the higher date, I suggested of 1406 or thereabouts. I always tell the same story at this point, so some of you have heard it before, and forgive me. Garstang was happily telling his colleagues in Liverpool about his discovery when the professor of music said to him, ah, when the Israelites marched round Jericho, they blew trumpets, didn't they? Yes. Right. What note did the trumpets play? <laughs> oh, he said, I can't possibly tell you that. I can, said the professor of music, B flat. <laughs> <laughs> New excavations were made on the mound in the 1950s by Dame Kathleen Kenyon from London University. And she used advances in knowledge and archaeological technique made since Garstang's time and was able to show that the walls that Garstang thought fell before Joshua were about a thousand years older than the time of Joshua. So there were no walls. Because of that, some people have said the story in Joshua is simply a fantasy. The Israelites saw this big ruin mound and thought, well, our ancestors must have destroyed whatever was left. It's very easy to make such a deduction. But it's probably not right. An Italian expedition 
has been excavating at Jericho in the last 15 years. And while it's not found any remains from Joshua's time within the main part of the mound, right down at the southern end, they have found some pottery and ruins of houses which seem to belong to the time when I would place Joshua. They've not been found on the main part of the mound because, as I said, there's been tremendous erosion there. And the Bible tells us that the city of Jericho was not rebuilt for over 300 years from the time of Ahab. So there was plenty of time for erosion to have destroyed any ruins on Joshua's land. I don't see any reason to doubt the report in the book of Joshua. We'll learn more about it when Ben talks to us in a few weeks' time. Having dealt with Jericho, the Israelites climbed up into the hills to attack the town of Ai Ai. It was quite a climb. It's about 13 miles from Jericho to Ai, and the site now lies about 2,000 feet above sea level. So you go from 800 feet below to 2,000 above in that 13 mile march. What happened at AI is a sorry, sorry story, which Ed will explain on Sunday morning in a few weeks' time. What I want to draw to your attention is the fact that the Hebrew word AI means ruin, and it's always written with the definite article. So it wasn't a place name like Jerusalem or Megiddo, it was the ruin. And it's interesting that the place identified today as ancient Ai is still called in Arabic Etel, Fatel, the ruin. Excavations were made there in the 1930s and enormous ruins were found of walls built about 2400 BC. There was nothing later until about 1100 BC. Oh, nobody lived at Ai. It wasn't a place the Israelites couldn't have conquered it. But I think the very fact of its name in the Bible being the ruin indicates that it was a ruin when the Israelites went there. <coughs> but it's a very good defensive position with a very strong ancient wall. And I think the local people took refuge there when they heard of the Israelites coming. Just as in this country, uh, people long ago took refuge in their hill forts <coughs> that we find dotted across the countryside. From AI, the Israelites conducted a, what we call a blitzkrieg, brief campaigns against the Canaanites in the south and the north so that they could occupy the whole of the promised land from Judah up to the northern border with modern Lebanon. The idea was to break any united opposition. Campaign to the south, campaign to the north. The book of Joshua lists the kings who were conquered and killed. But the idea was that the Israelite tribes should then go each to their own territory and take possession and deal with any Canaanites. Who were still left. One archaeologist has counted 31 places named in the book of Joshua chapter 12 as conquered by the Israelites and then he looked for signs of destruction. The Israelites might have burned and destroyed these cities and he found only two might have been destroyed at the time of Joshua. But like many others who sought for traces of destruction like this, he overlooked the verse that tells us Joshua Israel did not burn any of the cities which stood on their mounds, except Hatzor, a major one in the north. Indeed, Joshua had already burnt Jericho and Ai, but the Israelites were intended to occupy the promised land, which means 
they would occupy the towns of these Canaanites who'd been killed or driven out. So they wouldn't want to burn them, they'd just take over their properties and settle in them. We should also recognise that the biblical narrative uses what we might call an exaggerated style of writing. Hyperbolic is the technical word. When we read, for example, there was in the story of Joseph, there was famine in all the other lands and the countries all came to Egypt for food. That doesn't mean that people came from Britain or China to Egypt for food. It just means the places near Egypt. So all doesn't mean all. We have to be careful how we understand such a word. And at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, we read about John the Baptist and how all Jerusalem went out to see him baptising at the Jordan. But if you'd gone to Jerusalem then, you'd have still found old people like me and uh, disabled people and babes in arms and various others who hadn't gone out to the Jordan. So we need to be aware of the sort of language that appears in the Bible. One of the interesting aspects that we see at the change from the Late Bronze Age to the Iron Age is across the hill country, in the centre especially, lots and lots of very small villages, maybe just two or three houses, which had pottery of the sort used in the Late Bronze Age but continued into the Iron Age. And these settlements are all new. They're not taking over Canaanite settlements. They're new settlements. And it's believed by most people that these were Israelite villages occupying the promised land, occupying parts of the land which the Canaanites had not occupied. The houses and their equipment were quite simple. There's a uh, one built of stone this figure here shows you the wall, quite low stone wall, which probably had mud bricks on top, flat roof, three or four rooms, and at night, there's a courtyard at night, you bring the animals into the courtyard to keep them safe from wolves and other wild animals. In the late Bronze Age, just before this time, we find quite a number of what we may call shrines or temples. Here's an example. There's a lion guarding the entrance and pillars. This one has a pair of hands praying to the moon. It's possible that these pillars were originally covered with plaster and painted or inscribed. And in the book of Joshua we read how Joshua followed the commandment that had been given through Moses when they reached Shechem, the centre of the land, and they set up pillars on the mountain covered with the commandments God had given. And we know that it was a practice to cover such pillars with plaster and then write on them, and it could well be that that was what Joshua did. But of course, in the climate there, plaster surfaces out in the open air are not going to last for a very long time, so we're not going to find them, alas. So these, these shrines or temples disappear. They don't continue in the beginning of the Iron Age. And I think again, this is a sign of the Israelite presence destroying the places of worship. That the Canaanites had erected. We also find the figures of gods and goddesses that are common in the late Bronze Age and amulets which you could wear on your neck to protect you from evil all disappear because of course the Israelites were forbidden to make any images of gods. The Israelites never occupied the whole of their promised land. They occupied this much of it, 
they had some control of much more. And under King David, they had rule over a large area up to the Euphrates River, as forecast in the book of Joshua. But that didn't last for very long. As you find in the first chapter of Judges, the Israelites failed to drive out all the Canaanites, but lived beside them, conquering some, just settling as neighbours with others. The consequence, the book of Judges explains, was disastrous for the Israelites. They were infected by Canaanite movement. So there may be signs of Israelites appearing in the Holy Land, but archaeology can't shed any clear light on the conquest of Canaan. But that doesn't give us reason for doubting the biblical reports. I don't know whether you're aware of this. The first two events in British history were the invasions by Julius Caesar in 55 and 54 BC. Nobody has found any trace of Caesar's invasions in the south coast of Britain. We believe he came here because he says so. He says so in a book he wrote to show how good he'd been. <laughs> so it's possible that we all fantasy, but no serious historian believes that. And I think we should treat the Bible in the same way. It's possible. It fits well with what we know. There's no reason to doubt its reports. As Nathan has said, if you want to ask questions, I'll be happy to listen to them and try to answer them. Um, Alan, could you explain why Jericho is a mound when the area around is flat? Yes. If you go to London or Chester or a number of other towns in this country where the Romans lived, you'll find the Roman remains are five, six metres below the modern street level. In between, you have rubbish and bits of ruins of the towns that have stood there since. And if you demolished all the modern buildings and stood at a distance, you'd see that there's a mound created by those ruins. In the Holy Land and other parts of the Near East, where a lot of the bricks were simply sun-dried, they crumble much faster, and so you get a much bigger mound. And uh, a mound like Jericho is what um, 20 metres or more high and uh, as you dig down you have to be careful to shore up the sides or dig in a certain way so it doesn't collapse on top of you. But this is true across the Near East and in many other places too. So it's just the accumulation of debris from past occupations. And you often see it on television. They're showing preparations for building a new structure in some long-lived town that they've dug deep down to make foundations and dug through the early remains. And if they find something exciting, the contractors are very annoyed and they have to be to dig them up. Alan, yes. you said there was one bit of the wall. On the other, the Sorry, wall. I'm rather deaf. There was a part of the wall that was still standing in one area, whereas the rest had been destroyed with the, the action of the wind. So what made that one piece more resilient to the we wind? We can't tell. It may be that later on there was a building on top of it that protected it okay. when Jer Jericho was rebuilt. If anything that was on top of it disappeared, okay. as have all the um, courses of brickwork above those three or four. And that's the only one. Other parts of the mound have disappeared in time. Yes? Are archaeologists inclined to be Christians trying to prove something, or non Christians trying to disprove something, <laughs> or just neutral? 
the majority, I would say yes, the majority are not Christians. Many of them are, shall we say, scientists who want to learn about the history and culture of the Holy Land and other places. And so they go and they explore and excavate. And if something they find links with the Bible, then they find that's good. That's uh, reliable information from the biblical text. There are some who go who are agnostic or even anti-biblical, like the man who counted 30 towns that have been conquered and thought he'd find remains in them of the conquest, but only found something in two. And uh, these are people who follow modern liberal ideas about the Bible that say most of the books that we call historical books were only written in the days of the Persian kings in the time of the exile in the 6th and 4th centuries BC and so they are all imaginary. Yes. Um, the, the name I or AI is in uh, Genesis as well, yes. in Abraham's, you know, yes. the journey's going around. Is it the same place and it, was it called the ruin back then as well? We, we suppose it to be the same place and uh, the word means the ruin. Mm -hmm. And the walls were built, as I say, in the third millennium BC, which was centuries before Abraham. So it could well have been a ruin already. I don't. One more, yeah. more question. Um, Kathleen Kenyon, yeah. um, she said there was no city uh, around the time they arrived. Yeah. Um, That's right. So, how does that fit in with the account? This is where, as I say, at the beginning, archaeology is always moving forward. And those dealing with the past keep moving forward and uh, here you see the plan drawn by the Italian excavation in the last 15 years and they have found down at the south uh, remains of buildings from the period that Kathleen Kenyon said didn't exist in Jericho. She dug up on the top of the mound where there's been tremendous erosion and she un unearthed some of this building, which is a palace from about the time of Abraham, and that was at the top of the mound. Mm. So it's a matter of progress yeah. in the study. Mm. That's part of the, the enjoyment of archaeology. You never know what you're going to find. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. From, from my own bed, can I think of it trying to summarise? What I've heard you saying, you can tell me whether I've got that right or not. So in, in terms of the evidence around the book of Joshua in the Bible, the archaeological evidence, what I'm hearing you say, correct me if I'm right, is there isn't very much. So some people would conclude and go, oh, well, if there isn't much, it couldn't have happened. But that is a false expectation over what you'd expect. There is some, not very much, and what we have fits can fit in with the the kind of Bible accounts there. Is that a fair... Yes, I think so. Great. That's helpful to me. Thank I, you. I would add to that that there are other episodes in the book of Joshua which fit very well with the customs of the time. So when the people of Gibeon tricked the Israelites into making a treaty with them so they wouldn't destroy Gibeon, we find the treaty is very similar to other treaties that are known in documents from, from Syria to the north, written on clay tablets, so they've survived. Um, there are other examples. A lot of Joshua, as we shall find, is taken up with telling us the boundaries of the different tribal territories. And in some cases, they run alongside each other. So one tribe's territory is next door actually adjacent to the next tribe's territory. And we have some lists, again, from a place in Syria, written on clay tablets, which are surveys of part of a kingdom. And they show different groups of people sharing territory in the same way. 
as we find in Josh Wood. So there are these and other things like the Iron Chariot that fit in well with the customs and behaviour of people of those times. But they don't connect directly with what we read in Josh Wood. Am I right in saying you just mentioned that the structure in the middle of there yes. was from Abraham's ish time? More or less, yes. And that's the only bit that's left on the top of the map. That's right. Yes. Which, in your discussion of erosion, would make total sense. Yes. Everything above it, that's right. Jericho of Joshua's type, has been wiped off yes. by the wind, but at the bottom, where there's less wind, yes. a little bit remains, which would make yes. scientific common yes. sense. Yes. Um, yes. And furthermore, when Jericho was rebuilt, the people would have moved some of the old rubbish and ruins to make a basis for their new buildings. Or even reuse some of the blocks, oh, certainly. and they would have then been eroded as well. Certainly. Yeah. Yes. yes. When it comes to people like, um, I've forgotten his name, who came before Joshua? Moses. Moses and Joshua, which there is there archaeological evidence of their timings, or do we just rely on the Bible for that? There's no archaeological evidence, there's no evidence outside the Bible for the existence of Moses or Joshua. Right. There are no documents from Egypt, for example, that refer to Moses as the uh, adopted son of the Pharaoh's daughter, and no record from Egypt of the Israelites' exodus. Well, that's be well, that because the pharaohs only recorded their victories <laughs> and the exodus was not a victory. <laughs> so and the hand oh. Moses handing over, like saying to Joshua, um, look, and I was meant to be leading the Israelites here, but because of my disobedience, I'm not doing it. And the commission goes to you to take this land. Yes. That is based purely on biblical evidence. Yes. yes. Right. There's no evidence outside the Bible for the reason for Israel occupying the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Within the Bible, there's no. Mm -hmm. who, who is oh, who's the first biblical character who's got a cross reference to somewhere else? Oh. <laughs> Probably David. There's a, an inscription found in Tel Dan in the very north of Israel from about 830 BC, which was set up probably by a king of Damascus when he conquered Dan. And he talks about conquering Israelites and a king, one of the Israelite kings, and uh, the king of the house of David. Well, house of is a way of saying dynasty. So this inscription about 830 BC is referring back, hmm, getting on for 200 years, to David. Otherwise, the uh, first king we have referred to is Omri, who was king of Israel about 870 BC. And there's a very famous monument in the British Museum which shows the Assyrian king Shalmaneser and bowing down in front of him a man who represents Jehu, king of Israel, and he's named as uh, Jehu of the house of Omri. So the dynasty founded a bit earlier by Omri. Jehu didn't get off that dynasty, but the Assyrian weren't aware of it. Yeah. <coughs> Given that you know we're concentrating on Jericho, uh, the Israelites were making headway to Jericho across the Jordan. Yes. Has there any been any concentration of archaeological activity around the Jordan area, going into the direction of? Jericho? No, it um, would be quite difficult. <coughs> the Jordan today. It's quite a small river in uh, before the 20th century when some dams and water constructions were built. In the springtime, 
it flooded and was half a mile to a mile wide, virtually impossible to cross, which was why the miracle happened mm. that enabled the Israelites to cross, which I'm sure will be explained to us. But it's all mud down here. And so it wouldn't really be feasible to make any excavation. And I'm not sure what could be done. Keep yeah. sandals back. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any suggestion that the modern day Jericho, the boundaries are a bit more sort of larger maybe for the original Jericho? So is yes. there expeditions looking beyond that green area uh -huh. that you highlighted? Yeah. Here you see the ruin mound of ancient Jericho, and all around is an enormous oasis and town of Palestinians. And uh, when they dig wells or foundations outside the mound, <coughs> they sometimes find tombs where the people of Jericho were buried. Especially from about the time of Abraham, they built, they dug shafts into the ground and hollowed a room out in the, in the rock and used that as a burial place. Quite a number of those have been found. And if you go to the British Museum, you'll see one that's reconstructed there. And they usually held many different bodies. So you may find 30 or 40 people buried in one tomb, which of course is what happened at the cave of Machpelah. Abraham bought the cave to be a burial place for Sarah in the first case, but later on he was buried there and other members of his family. But uh, they don't have names on the tombs. The tomb at Hebron, which is said to be the place, is, has been emptied and looted many times over the centuries. It has nothing in it from antiquity. Yes? What was the dating of the Dead Sea Scrolls? I know there was a big deal about someone finding Dead Sea Scrolls or yeah. something. When were they? Well, Not I could okay. give you another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> the Dead Sea Scrolls are remains of books written on leather, which belong to a very religious, very conservative Jewish sect. And they date from between 200 BC to AD 67. The people who owned them uh, knew the Romans were coming. And so they hid most of their scrolls in caves. And that's where they've been discovered. Because the caves by the Dead Sea are extremely arid. And so there was no dampness to destroy the leather manuscripts. In a few cases, bats and birds had uh, been in the caves. And their droppings were acidic and destroyed some of the manuscripts. In other cases, damp had got in and spoiled them. But that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. And amongst them are copies of books of the Bible in Hebrew, which are older than any other copies we'd ever seen, about 2,000 years old. So they show us, for example, what a scroll of Isaiah would have looked like when the Lord Jesus went into the synagogue at Nazareth and it was passed to him and he read and explained it. A fascinating study, as I say. Need another lecture or two. Any final questions for Alan? If not, why don't we show a round of applause?